Let me know when the live stream starts. Is it all going? Yeah? All right. So a very good morning to everybody. And I hope you slept well. I hope that the Q&A didn't go on too long. I know that um, in the past, Ajahn Brahm sometimes used to stretch it till 9.30, but of course he was younger. And then I realized we were all younger too. So <laughs> hopefully uh, there was something beneficial there and nobody is suffering from a lack of sleep. So uh, we come to the close of another retreat. And the good news is you're one retreat closer to enlightenment, right? <laughs> That's one nice way to see it. Same with birthdays. Every time you have a birthday, oh, I'm one year older, or you're one year closer to enlightenment if you're on the path. So it's not a bad thing. The same thing as we come to the end of our lives, right? Yesterday, somebody asked about dying and the natural fears that I'm sure most of us have, you know, because we forget that we've died so many times before, we really forget that we know how to do these things. And so we have this trepidation, but for a practitioner, for a meditator, what a wonderful opportunity to let go of these five senses. A big heap of suffering passes away, and hopefully you take, of course, you take all the qualities that you've developed throughout your lives with you. And it's the same thing when you leave this center, Jhana Grove, a beautiful forested retreat center where you have many Kalyanamittas, and the opportunity to really deepen especially the last three factors of the path, right? Retreat time is an opportunity to really um, start to cultivate some of these beautiful, wholesome qualities, our friends, if you like, our mental friends, and keep some of those difficult emotions and qualities out. And also, of course, to establish mindfulness in the correct way, not just as so-called bare awareness, which is never really bare, but the kind of mindfulness that is infused by those very same good qualities that can then lead into states of peace. However deep you might feel your meditation goes, hopefully each of you have noticed that you're, you have experienced some moments of peace. You have experienced the mind gradually settling down as you sit to practice. You might come in here feeling a bit agitated or, I don't know, maybe too full. <laughs> And, but over the hour, or however long you meditate for, the mind, the body, the whole system starts to settle, and you can really appreciate that peace. So retreat times like this offer an incredible opportunity to really deepen our meditation practice. But it can be a little bit daunting to go back outside. I don't know how many of you are looking forward to going back to your usual lives, but you won't be the same usual people. Right? You'll be different. You'll have changed. And it's important to recognize that our everyday lives offer us the most wonderful opportunities to develop the rest of the Eightfold Path. And I want to speak particularly today, not directly about the Eightfold Path, but this is um, a sutta called the Avidya Sutta, which you can relate to the Eightfold Path. It's really wonderful, as Ajahn Brahmali said, when you start to read the suttas and see the patterns and see how they interrelate. It's like a beautiful mosaic that suddenly comes alive and you see all the pictures, the patterns, the, the beauty, the kind of harmony in that. And in this Avidya Sutta, it, Avidya means delusion. It is a little bit, bit like Buddhism A to Z. <laughs> A being avidya, delusion, and Z being true knowledge and liberation. So we're looking at how we get from one to the other. And in that sutta, there's some very helpful um, areas that we can cultivate in our daily life. So we can strengthen this, and this becomes the foundation for the practice, so that next year when you come back, hopefully, if you can book fast enough, <laughs> because your mindfulness is really fast, right? So as soon as the booking comes out, phoom, I know what I want. <laughs> your fingers go really fast, so, and you get in because of your good karma. So uh, next time when you come back, if you've been cultivating these foundational practices, you'll find that you haven't regressed. You actually pick up almost from where you left off, and sometimes with even more beautiful qualities to bring to the practice, because you've been developing this in everyday life. 
There's another lovely sutta, uh, and I think it might be in the Dhammapada, which gives me a lot of faith. It says, basically, it's as though the practice is putting drops in a jar, a huge jar, like really big jars that maybe you can't even see the top of, and they're opaque, so you don't see through them. You don't see how much water's in that jar. But you can just about reach and put a drop in. At any moment, actually, in life, because that drop is always what we're doing with the mind right now, right? the way we're regarding the world, the way we're regarding ourselves and other people around us. So we can always try to make it a little bit kinder, a little bit softer, add some patience, add some gentleness, add some wisdom, some right view, and put a drop in the jar. And although you don't see how many drops are there, you can have the confidence that each drop is an addition to that jar. Bit by bit, that water's filling up, filling up, filling up, and eventually it overflows. I want to just touch on this for about two minutes, so I hope my timing is good, but somebody yesterday asked me how we got the monastery in Oxford, finally, after about nine years. And the analogy of this drops in the water jar is quite relevant here, because for nine years, I'd been working extremely hard with the help of a lot of people, including, of course, my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, our teacher, and uh, organizing events, tours, teachings, spending sometimes whole days, like my favorite Led Zeppelin song that Ajahn Brahm often teases me about. I haven't listened to Led Zeppelin, by the way, since I was about 15 or 16. But anyway, maybe 18. <laughs> but anyway, I remember this particular lyric, which was working from 7 till 11 every night really makes life a drag, and I'm trying not to sing. <laughs> but this is how my life has been, you know, not a drag, but certainly working from 7 in the morning to 11 at night plus on occasions. And sometimes it felt like, are we really going to make it? Are we really going to ever achieve this ideal of having a monastery where women can train to becoming, you know, fully ordained? And uh, I was losing hope a little bit. It was about November last year and Ajahn Brahm was in England and uh, we were on a train coming back down from Liverpool where he'd just met his uh, extended family, his first cousins actually, two of them. Interestingly, the female cousin who was his dad's sister, elder sister, said that it was her mother, in other words, Ajahn Brahm's dad's father, <coughs> who taught them, the door of my heart is open to you no matter what. And she used to say to her daughter, Ajahn's cousin, <laughs> who was Ajahn's dad's elder sister, my love is unconditional. So this was very interesting because that came from a woman. <laughs> So that was actually from Ajahn Brahm's father's elder sister. But anyway, we'd been visiting them and it was a very beautiful, uh, joyful time. And we were on a train coming back into Oxford. And I said, you know, I just, I don't see how we're going to do it because there's only one location that we can really establish this monastery where there'll be enough support. And it's so expensive. You know, it's one of the most expensive parts of Oxfordshire, which is one of the most expensive parts of England. But at least I have a few locals and, you know, there's also a bhikkhu sangha in Oxford, a monk sangha, who are quite supportive. And this is really important, you know, as the only bhikkhuni in the country, it can be extremely isolating. So, you know, I, I realized that really it had to be in Oxford or the surrounding area. And this particular area was very pretty, very tranquil, but also quite costly. So... I was about to kind of lose hope and Ajahn said, oh, you know, I don't know what we can do really. Maybe we have to get a loan. I thought, oh, I don't want a big loan on my shoulders on top of all the rest. So I said, okay, I'm going to restrain myself. I'm not going to go down that negative kind of hopeless train of thought. Let me just look online. And I looked and you wouldn't believe it. In that same area, there was a property. By now I was an expert in floor plans, so I went straight to the floor plan. And uh, the floor plan was perfect. It had a separate room which was away from the kitchen that could be used for meditation, as well as a big room that could be used for the dana sala, where the monastics received their alms. Even the kitchen was big enough so that the lay people could eat separately from the monastics. And about an acre and a quarter of land, which here seems like just a backyard, right? 
But in England, that's quite decent and not too much to maintain. But the best thing was it was in an area of 200 acres preservation trust land on top of a hill, which as Ajahn said, you know, holy people live on hills, not in swamps. <laughs> Actually, it's a bit of a bog most of the year. It's a bit of a mudslide going down, but you know, you get your wellies and you're protected. So, and this property was probably a th two thirds of the price of most properties of a similar size. So I was so excited, and I said to Ajahn, "Right, I'm phoning the agent." He said, "What? Just like that?" I said, "Yep." <laughs> so I got on my phone, which is where phones come in handy. And I phoned the agent and they happened to have a viewing on the one morning that we had an hour free. So myself and Ajahn Brown went to view the place. And as soon as we opened the door, it was like one of those moments. I was like, hmm, this is nice. Keeping cool, you know, but went into the first room, light, bright. There was even a little area that I could see could be used as a shrine. So I was like, hmm, I like it. Went into the next room. I really like it. <laughs> and I'm not someone who you have to guess their feelings. Like I show my emotions on my face. So by the time we'd been around the whole place, I'm like, I love it actually. And the agent said to Ajahn, is she always like this, effusive? So I kind of took my power back. I said, you know, I know what I'm looking for. I've been looking for properties for nine years. This is right in this way, in this way, in this way. This is what we want to go for. So I think that did as well. Ajahn later said, oh, you know, you have to be a bit mm, tricky with these agents, but I think it did as well because there were another two bidders and uh, we won out in the end simply because they knew we were serious. They knew we were highly motivated and this was our place, you know, it just fit. But the reason I'm telling this story is because the outpouring of support that came when we, we still needed a really big loan, about 800,000 pounds, which is about 15,000 Aussie dollars. We still need a huge loan to be able to secure the place. And so, you know, it was very kind of touch and go. I was pretty cool. I wasn't, you know, overly invested or nervous about it, but I thought, let's just see what happens next. And the most beautiful thing was that we were teaching, Ajahn really was teaching a weekend retreat the next day <laughs> after seeing this property. And we put the idea to the Anukampa community. So these are, sure, they come to Ajahn's teachings, but they're mostly the disciples that have gathered around our project in England. And the amazing thing to me was that among that community of people who are not well off, people who are mostly volunteering in the project, and who already gave a lot, they were all offering interest-free loans. You know, some really quite a lot of money, sometimes 30,000, and it was their entire savings, you know, young people who obviously had put it away or had it inherited or something. And they were saying, like one woman came to me with tears streaming down her face and she just said, I've decided to do it. I want to do this, you know, because it really, really matters to me. And not only women, men too from every background, every race, every gender specification or identity. And I realized at that point, we're ready. You know, this project's ready. Although, you know, I haven't seen the seeds flourishing yet. For me, I've been focused on planting the seeds, planting the seeds, this email, this change to the website, quite mundane things. Over time, in incredible flowers have been growing. Incredible flowers with really strong roots probably bulbs, you know, that come back every year. I don't know which the strongest flowers are. And I hadn't noticed that. I mean, to some extent, I could see them coming. But all of a sudden, the forest bloomed. And this is what can happen in our practice. We're putting those drops in the jar. We're not sure it's really working. Sometimes we seem to be getting peaceful. The next day, our mind's all over the place again, you know? It's as though we've never practiced. You think, wow, even in lay life, normal life, everyday life, in the monastery too. I'm more peaceful than this. I come on retreat and my mind goes crazy. Has it been working? But you know, you just keep putting those drops. You just keep nurturing those seeds, shining the sunshine of kindness and the light of mindfulness on those little plants and trusting that the soil you're planting them in is really fertile. And one day, whoom, suddenly the flowers bloom 
You see it in Australia, you see all the bush flowers coming out. It's like a kind of orchestra. You've probably missed the best part of spring, to be honest. <laughs> Actually, it's a good part of spring, but when it starts, it's fantastic because you see these really scrappy bushes, like they're spiky, they're prickly. You just think they're pretty much dead. Half of them are usually dead because of the droughts and stuff. But then suddenly, these exquisite, really delicate little flowers bloom. And within a couple of days, all the yellow flowers. The next day, all these pink orchids come out. And do you ever judge those flowers and say, well, the white ones are more advanced than the pink ones because they came out first? <laughs> do we think like that? <laughs> it's maybe a month later that the whole thing seems to turn blue. Like now we have a lot of blue orchids and uh, Lechinoltia, which is a lovely blue uh, bush flower. Do we think, oh, those blue flowers are so behind? <laughs> We never think that. We just understand that the reason these flowers have bloomed is because the causes and conditions are ripe for them to bloom, right? So when the time is right, when the soil or the moisture or the sunshine is, you know, reaches a certain level, it's warm enough for them, then they blossom. And they can be so exquisite, like you never imagined they could be. So completely different from anything we see in our own countries, if we're not Australian, <laughs> or maybe from South Africa, they're a little bit similar. And uh, all we know is that we were planting the seeds all along. We can look back in retrospect and we can see how it happened. So imagine when you're enlightened. You know, you'll know that you're enlightened. Enlightenment comes with the knowledge of enlightenment, the knowledge that you've seen suffering, you've understood the cause, and you've uprooted that cause. You've followed the Eightfold Path to its completion. <clears throat> but looking at enlightenment from here, of course, you never knew it was going to happen on that particular day at that particular time, right? Maybe you still doubt that it can be true for you. But I think the more we immerse ourselves in these teachings, the more we understand that we don't do the practice. We don't cultivate the path on our own. And this is what I love about this sutta. So I will get onto it, because otherwise the time will go. <laughs> <clears throat> so somebody asked a question. Uh, two or three days ago, I don't know, about ignorance, about delusion, avidya, and how it begins. And this is the sutta that describes how delusion doesn't have a first cause, or not a first point, let's say. We can't find where it began exactly. So this is from the Anguttara Tens, and it's number 61. So the Buddha says this, bhikkhus, and I have to um, remind everybody here that the word bhikkhus includes the whole fourfold assembly, okay? I don't believe there were no bhikkhunis present or no laymen or women present. It's just that he would address the most senior members of the group and the bhikkhus took ordination first. It took some time after the Buddha's enlightenment to establish the bhikkhuni sangha. So let's say community. This is said, a first point of ignorance or delusion community is not seen such that before this, there was no delusion and afterward it came into being. <clears throat> Still, delusion is seen to have a specific condition. I say, community, that delusion has a nutriment. And the word nutriment is a translation of ahara, which also can mean food or sustenance. It can also mean cause. Nutriment, something that nourishes those roots. It's not without a nutriment. And what is the nutriment for delusion? It should be said, the five hindrances. And this is the first reason that meditation practice is aimed at weakening those hindrances so that we can actually start to starve delusion of its nutriment, of its food, of its ability to continue. Right? Because the, the five hindrances distort reality. It's not just that they make it hard to see what's happening. <coughs> We might see something through the kind of lens of the hindrances or the curtains of the hindrances. It's a bit like a veil that you can just about see through. But it's not only that you can't see it clearly, you actually misperceive what you're seeing, right? If you're looking at something through, say, smoke or a veil of some sort, it appears different from what it really is. Maybe it's, you know, you see it as a person, but it's actually just a shadow made by, a kind of, made by your hand <laughs> and the reflection of that shadow on the wall. 
So you're taking it to be something it isn't when you look through the hindrances. So we try to overcome these hindrances through our meditation practice, and much of it at most of our stages, and even for stream winners, they haven't completely abandoned the five hindrances. They will come up from time to time. So we're trying to remove these. But the five hindrances too, I say, have a nutriment, and they're not without a nutriment. And what is the nutriment for the five hindrances? It should be said, the three kinds of misconduct. So that is a lack of virtue of speech, bodily action, and mental action as well. So I'm going to stop here with this particular sequence from delusion on, because I want to be more positive and go the other way around. But this is really important in the beginning to point out that it's the three kinds of misconduct that then lead us to the five hindrances. They nourish the five hindrances, they increase them, they make them thick and sticky and hard to navigate, hard to see through. And because of that delusion becomes even more deeply entrenched. So in the opposite sequence, the point of conduct, our conduct, our virtue is a pivotal point. And when we have good conduct, instead of leading to the five hindrances and delusion, good conduct actually leads to the four establishments of mindfulness, or let's say the four focuses, which is Ajahn Brahm's translation and my preferred translation. So instead of you know, bad conduct leading to five hindrances, we have good conduct leading to the practice of the four focuses of mindfulness. And that includes the practice of breath meditation. Anapanasati, when fully cultivated and developed, completes the four satipatthanas. So yesterday somebody asked, is metta in itself a practice that can take you all the way? And I said, yes, from my perspective it is. Because metta also takes us through the realm of feelings, the realm of joy and settling the mind, calming the mind, removing those hindrances and taking us all the way into deep samadhi where the hindrances are actually overcome. They've been abandoned at that point and we have the opportunity, I say opportunity, because it's not inevitable that we'll see things as they are, but we have a window where the hindrances aren't operative and we can actually, what we see is a little bit more dependable than usual because we're seeing it with clarity, with, um, with a clear lens, yeah? So these good conducts lead to the four focuses of mindfulness being established quite easily we don't have to struggle so much. The Buddha said, you know, that anybody that practices these four focuses of mindfulness can get enlightened. At most, I think it was within seven years. Is that right? I've got my sutta expert at the back. But at least within seven days. Okay, seven days is like if you really have a lot of good karma, <laughs> a lot of practice power, maybe a lot of jhana practice. Um, but, you know, it has to happen eventually. Eventually it will be only seven days until our enlightenment, right? <laughs> we just don't know when. And this is when we've established, you know, a really strong sila to the extent that the five hindrances are very, very weak and we can overcome them just through the practice of the Satipatthana. And then through those Satipatthanas, the seven enlightenment factors are developed. And the seven enlightenment factors go through the whole realm of happiness, let's say. So we're now well on the way out of suffering and we experience a lot of joy as we start to experience suffering, disappearing, diminishing, dissolving, and eventually being completely overcome. So that's the higher end of the path when we have the good conduct. But what I wanted to talk about more is focusing on the first um, part of this sutta and the prerequisite for that good conduct in the first place. Okay. So I'm going to go the opposite way and talk about true knowledge and liberation. So I say, community, that true knowledge and liberation have a nutriment or a cause. They're not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for true knowledge and liberation? It should be said, now you know the answer, 
the seven enlightenment factors. The seven factors of, factors of enlightenment too, I say, have a nutriment. They're not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for the seven factors of enlightenment? It should be said, the four focuses of mindfulness. The four focuses of mindfulness too, I say, have a nutriment. They are not without a nutriment. And what is the nutriment for the four focuses of mindfulness? It should be said, the three kinds of good conduct. Okay, so this is where we've got to so far. Going back further, the three kinds of good conduct too, I say, have a nutriment. They are not without a nutriment. And what is the nutriment for the three kinds of good conduct? That's virtue of body, speech, and mind. It should be said, restraint of the sense faculties. Yeah? This is indriya samvara sila, which is a much nicer word because indriya samvara sila means kind of protecting, or you can say restraining, but kind of guarding the sense faculties. And it's a kind of sila. Sila means virtue. So this is when we start to have ethical behavior in the way we use our minds, much more subtle than the way we speak and, and act. It's actually stemming from a mental root here, so it's deeper. So let's call it guarding. I prefer guarding the sense faculties. Two, I say, has a nutriment. It is not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for guarding the sense faculties? Any, any guesses? These two go hand in hand, so it's really interesting because in the gradual training, the other one comes first. Sense faculties precede mindfulness and clear comprehension. But here, it says that mindfulness and clear comprehension are the nutriment for guarding the sense faculties. And I'll go into these in more detail soon. Mindfulness and clear comprehension too, I say, have a food or a nutriment and a um, sustenance. They are not without sustenance. I'm changing it a bit. And what is the sustenance or the food for mindfulness and clear comprehension? It should be said, careful attention. So I'm going to change that to wise attention. Careful attention is a translation for yoniso manasikara. But actually it means something like the attention or the work of the mind that goes back to the source of things, to the origin. Yoni means womb, where things arise from. And I think there's a big difference between wise attention and careful attention. You know, you can be careful, for example, about what you're eating, right? You can be careful. You can eat it carefully. There's a plate of delicious food and you take care to chew it. You make sure you eat the right amount. You know, you don't indulge and you're very mindful of chewing and swallowing the food. But what if you're eating a plate of food that's actually not good for you? You know, if there's garlic in that food, for me, I'm going to get really, really sick and have gastric problems for the next few weeks. Or if you have celiac disease, then, you know, and there's wheat in that food, you can be very careful about how you eat it. But is it wise to, to go for that cake when you're going to suffer with headaches and bloating for the next month? So wise attention is something much more um, aimed at attending in a way that overcomes the defilements again, attending to things in a way that cultivates the wholesome qualities and undermines the unwholesome ones in our minds. So wise attention also has a nutriment. What is the nutriment for that? It should be said, faith, sada. Now faith is a very Christian translation. I prefer something like inspired confidence. So there is a level of inspiration there. There's an energy source. There's some sort of devotion, some sort of trust. But there's a confidence. It's based on wisdom. And it's, it gives us the energy to take the next step. So it's not a blind faith. So let's call it confidence here. And confidence has a nutriment. It's not without nutriment. What is the nutriment for confidence? 
it should be said, hearing the good Dhamma. Yeah. We hear the Dhamma, it makes sense to us, something resonates in our heart. Sometimes we feel as though the Buddha is speaking to us directly, to our human condition, you know, the human condition that hasn't changed in 2,600 years and beyond, right? All Buddhas, even of previous eons, are said to teach the noble truths. So these are timeless truths that are universal in their application and in their efficacy too. So faith arises when we hear the good Dhamma. But hearing the good Dhamma also has a nutriment. It's not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for hearing the good Dhamma? It should be said, associating with good persons. Again, that word good could be translated as wise. Usually it refers to the Arya Sangha, somebody who's seen the Dhamma, but it can also refer to people who are practicing the path, people who are our spiritual friends and companions on the path, who are at least starting to incline their, well, to try to bend or, or shape their speech, uh, their bodily action and their ways of thinking to the Dhamma, to the Eightfold Path. So associating with good persons. So this is actually the first cause that starts this sequence going in the opposite direction from delusion. It's associating with good persons. Isn't that amazing that it can be such a simple cause? Does it seem like a simple cause to you? And yet it shows us the profundity of this and perhaps the rareness, the preciousness of actually coming in contact with somebody who's practicing the path and who's realized the path to a certain extent. Of course, the Buddha is our main Kalyanamitta, our main wise companion. And this is why I love to read the suttas. I love to go to the word of the Buddha because I know that I haven't experienced these teachings to their depth, but I have confidence, inspired confidence that the Buddha is somebody who has. And that's why it's been worth preserving the, these teachings for 2,600 years. And they have been preserved really beautifully and pretty accurately. When you do the cross uh, parallel studies with the Chinese Agamas, you find that there's very little difference even though they were preserved in different parts of the world. And wherever there is something that looks a little bit um, strange, like it's crept in over time, or maybe it's a little bit sexist, or maybe there's some kind of verse that doesn't seem quite in accord with the rest of the suttas. When you check them out with the Chinese parallels, you find, oh, it was missing in those texts, or perhaps it was missing in the Pali. Usually it was missing in the Chinese and it's been added to the Pali. And that gives some kind of authenticity to this. But really the best authenticity is that the practice works, right? That we actually start associating with good people and we see that the way we think and the way we view the world starts to change. So this is the arising in a sense, the first occasion that right view has the chance to arise. And that's why it's the beginning of the path. It's parallel, right, to the Eightfold Path, which starts with right view. Of course, you have to have uh, contact with the teachings to establish faith, to establish that right view in the first place. And for this reason, the Buddha said that the whole of the Eightfold Path depends on wise friends. The whole of the spiritual path is wise friendship because when we have wise friends, we're bound to develop the Eightfold Path as a natural course, a natural part of the process, if you like, even despite ourselves. You know, when you go back into your lives, you might find that sometimes your speech is not so kind, but you'll realize it, you'll know it, because you've established some mindfulness, you've heard these teachings, and you'll remember them and you'll realize, oh, the reason I'm feeling, you know, kind of, a bit of guilty at the moment, or there's some tension or trepidation about seeing this person again is because I didn't speak so skillfully. I must have, you know, taken a wrong course at that time. I must have strayed from the path. You know it in yourself. And there's something remarkable, isn't there, about being a human being. We seem to have this innate capacity to understand what's for our good and benefit and what's for the good and benefit of others because it feels right. It feels wholesome. It's ennobling beautiful word, ennobling, and it uplifts the mind, you know. So whenever we do have beautiful conduct and, you know, we are following the path, 
The mind is glad, the mind is happy, free from remorse. And because of this, there's some kind of sense of, of settling in the mind. You know, we feel contented, we feel satisfied with the way our lives are leading. So the other really important point about wise friendship and how it relates to wisdom is that the whole path is entirely conditioned. You know, we as human beings or what we take ourselves to be are entirely conditioned. Sometimes we think, oh yes, I can understand that I am a product of causes and conditions, or I am conditioned. But actually, take away the I. All we experience is conditions. All we experience is a process, is causes and conditions playing out. We just kind of assume an I. We overlay this whole thing with this identity of a person and understandably we have to sort of say to somebody oh hi uh Wei Li. I can't say hi that bunch of five candles over there with the glasses on and the gray <laughs> that'd be really weird wouldn't it and you'd be like hey five candles with the robe <laughs> that robe not that robe <laughs> that five candles so we have to use this conventional ways of speaking but in reality you know all of what what manifests is the product of conditions and this is a very liberating teaching. It's a very positive teaching because it means they can be shaped. These conditions can be shaped to incline towards the Dhamma, right? We have some ability to influence this process. And this process is influenced first and foremost by our spiritual friends. So in the suttas, it says that the wise friend instructs with teachings on the Dhamma, encourages to practice those teachings, gladdens us by sharing the Dhamma in ways that inspire, inspires us to continue. So again, this is an energy source, and it's an energy that comes through faith, through confidence, not through the sense of self. So we're starting to get out of the way, and this amazing faith in the Dhamma is starting to take over, and that becomes the fuel for the path, yeah? And also, in another little sutta, which I, I forget where it is, it's somewhere in the Anguttas, I think. Um, wise friends are people that we can emulate. And I like this very much because sometimes it's not enough just to hear the teachings and just to feel inspired and encouraged. Sometimes we need to have examples to follow. And just by being around people that exude so much kindness, so much peace, people who are honest, people we can really trust, that we know are not there to deceive us in any way, but just have our own interests at heart. That can be so transformative for the heart. Just being around them gives us a sense of what's possible for us. We see our own potential reflected back. You know, the wise friend ultimately is never something outside ourselves. They're just there to remind us of our own capacity for awakening that we're no different from anybody else. As long as we come in contact with the Dhamma and we establish a sense, or a sense of faith is established in us, then the rest of the path can unfold. So from this wise friendship, we hear the good Dhamma, we hear the teachings on the noble truths. And even to condense the noble truths further, the Buddha basically said that he teaches two things. He teaches suffering, I think that's great, personally. I don't think that's a, a miserable thing at all. And the end of suffering. And the reason I, th I found this teaching completely transformative was that I was very aware that I was suffering. And everyone told me that's normal. Well, actually, sorry, no, not that that's normal. That there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. I shouldn't be suffering. I have a nice family, best friend, doing well at school. You know, all the possibilities in life to choose whatever career path I want, etc., etc. Why am I suffering? And I thought, why are you not suffering? <laughs> why, how is it that you can turn on the news and see, you know, all the wars in the world and the poverty, the abuses of power? I think at that time it must have been the Falkland War or something when I was about 15. And I just thought, how can human beings do this to each other? You know, it was clear to me that the Buddha's teaching on suffering later on when I came in contact with it, was not only about personal suffering, it was the fact that all beings, humanity is in a state of suffering. 
You know, suffering is universal. And perhaps at this moment we're okay, but somewhere in the world there are people living in fear, there are people without food, there are people who are desperate, you know, who've lost their children. Suffering is real. And for me, somehow I intuited this and people were telling me, oh, you know, you shouldn't be suffering because of that. Everything's great. You know, go outside, look at the flowers, look at the sun. And I thought, hang on a minute. There's got to be a cause to this. There's got to be a meaning to suffering. Otherwise, why are we born into this? And when I heard these noble truths that there is suffering, but suffering has an end, I realized this is the reason, this is the cause for the suffering in a sense. This is how we can make use of that suffering. We can find the end. And with the Four Noble Truths, it's important to maintain that perspective that they are universal because then compassion can arise as an appropriate response. And this leads us in a sense to the next factor in this path from faith in the teachings, from hearing the Dhamma, we start to attend carefully, wisely to the life. And this includes the right intentions, the three right intentions. Does everybody know what they are? The second factor of the path? Yeah, this is Ajahn Brahm's make peace, be kind, be gentle. But one of them that's really important is the being gentle, which is actually avihimsaka. Another translation for that can be compassion. So because of suffering, because we have the perspective of suffering and some understanding of the depth and breadth of the problem, compassion can arise instead of despair. And again, this is taking us on the right track. So instead of suffering leading to more suffering, suffering starts to lead to the end of suffering. Compassion arises, an appropriate response. And we can see that just as I sometimes struggle with ill health or with a wandering mind or with loneliness, with grief, this is a universal phenomena all beings suffer in the same way. And instead of becoming tight and contracted and isolated in our own little bubble of pain, we start to open out, we start to connect with other people. I don't know about you, but until certain types of suffering happened in my life, I didn't really understand what others were going through. You know, when I was young and healthy, I could basically go and do whatever I wanted to do. You know, if my mind was ready, then my body would follow like a little dog. Okay, I want to go here, body, and the body would follow. I could eat whatever I wanted. I even drank the local water in India. Maybe not so wise. <laughs> but, you know, you could always, I, I just had about enough traveler's funds to be able to buy some antibiotics over the counter. You could get whatever you needed there in the chemist. So parasites was one type of antibiotic, bacterial infections was another. So you, you got smart as to what kind you had and you just bought the antibiotics and carried on, you know. But 10, 15 years into my life in Asia, this was no longer the case and I got really, really sick. And this was quite humbling for me. I realized that, you know, sometimes the body is not able to do whatever the mind wants it to. And the Buddha talks about something called the conceit of youth, the conceit of health, where we think, you know, that we can just exploit this body <laughs> to our own ends. And being sick, being chronically ill, which I still am with gastric troubles, has been incredibly humbling for me. During this rains, I was actually so sick in the first month, I guess, that I couldn't really meditate much at all. Every time I sat down for more than an hour, I got incredible amounts of acid reflux and belching, and it was just aggravating the condition. And it came to the point where I realized I needed to do something to address this issue, more than I was already doing. And I don't want to recommend this to anybody okay, so I say this with a caveat, but for this particular condition, which I'm very well acquainted with, um, there is something called a medical fast. So I actually embarked on this medical fast, which included some kind of um, liquid diet um, to start to starve the bacteria. And this went on for a couple of weeks. And during this time, I had no choice but to just be at the beck and call of the body. 
When the body wanted to sleep, I laid down to sleep. If I determined to get up after an hour, forget about it. The body would sleep for two. So this was wonderful because for once I really did surrender to the body and allow the healing process to happen. And for two or three weeks, probably more like a whole month, I went through this process of reintroducing food at the end, which took a lot of restraint. And it was incredibly strengthening for the mind because the attitude was one of gentleness and compassion. It was a place where, in a way, renunciation and restraint met with that compassion. You know, these right intentions, kindness, letting go, or renunciation and compassion, they're interrelated. So I noticed, you know, as I was reintroducing food, that sometimes in the cottage everything's offered in the morning, so there is some food there for me. So sometimes I'd go into the cupboard and there'd be some knots or something, and I'd know it was a bit too heavy for my digestion, but I fancied to take them, you know, because I was really quite hungry by now. <laughs> But there'd be this very quiet and firm voice just saying no, just no, in a very gentle and kind way, but in a very restrained way. And, and the mind just followed. You know, there was really this sense of knowing what was good for me, knowing what was appropriate, and acting out of compassion and restraint. So this was really strengthening, and I found the same attitude I had to the body started to infiltrate into the mind, and my mind sort of abandoned all notions of how a retreat should be, how much I should meditate. Although I don't think I carry these around, right? But it's always relative. And the retreat just unfolded in such a beautiful, organic and spontaneous way. The retreat is still happening for me. So, you know, this is the first Dhamma talk I'm giving for like two and a half months. And my mind is kind of still adjusting to the use of speech and moving my mouth. <laughs> So the retreat is very organic and, you know, no rules at all. No rules, just responding to the situation. If I can be of service, wonderful. You know, I use that renunciation to give. Giving is a very beautiful way of attending wisely. You know, when we practice, we're not practicing to gain things, we're practicing to let go. I know you've heard this kind of slogan again and again and again. But one of the ways I like to think about um, letting go is in its positive sense of giving. So when we meditate, can we actually um, practice from the perspective of giving to ourselves, giving ourselves the gift of peace, the gift of silence, the gift of just acquainting ourselves with our bodies and mind, and also a gift to all beings. Because again, by meeting our own suffering, by starting to turn towards it with kindness, with gentleness, with compassion, we're actually connecting with the suffering that all beings experience and finding a beautiful, appropriate, and wise response. So our meditation becomes a gift to all beings in our lives that we're going to encounter. We can't be too lofty and say it's a gift to humanity, right? Most people couldn't care if you're sitting on your cushion or not. It's not that, you know, our meditation is necessarily going to help the lives of people in the Middle East, for example. But who knows, you know, we, it has this kind of ripple effect and we start to influence those around us, those we care about. And maybe they get inspired and start to tell their friends about this practice. So we meditate in a way that is a gift to others. It can be a gift to our teachers, right? Ajahn Brahm often says, if you want to give me a gift, practice. Practice what I teach. You know, apply the Dhamma in the best way you can and spread it to others. Pass it on, you know, don't just give me things back in return, but keep that chain of giving going. What do they call it? Paying it forward or something like that. So it's not just between two people going backwards and forwards. It's spreading, it's spreading outwards and beyond. So we start to attend in this way. And of course, another way of attending wisely to whatever's arising in the mind is to attend with compassion. It's as if there are many perceptions we can pick up at any given time. Imagine there's like a shop and it's full of spectacles and each pair of spectacles has a different lens. Some are very distorted, they're the hindrances, right? Very thick lenses with too much focus or not enough, and everything looks distorted when you see through that lens. Some are very kind of dirty lenses, maybe because our precepts haven't been good. 
But some lenses are really clear and other ones might even be tinted a little bit yellow or pink, however you imagine loving kindness. And this can be an antidote as well to things like ill will. So when we pick up the perception of loving kindness and attend with eyes of kindness to whatever's arising in the mind, it's not that our quality of mind alone changes, but what we see actually starts to change. There's this beautiful simile in the suttas called the salt crystal, the lump of salt. I think it's Anguttara 3, number 10. Um, my sutta expert is not in the back, but I'm pretty sure of this one. It's number three, Anguttara 3 is number 10. And this talks about how when our minds are expansive with qualities like loving kindness, our actual experience changes. So it's not only that we attend to different things, you know, we attend to the beauty in a person rather than the faults, but the way we perceive that person actually changes as well. The quality of our mind shapes our reality. So the practice of metta becomes a practice in the training of perception, which gives rise to a lot of wisdom about the conditioned nature of this experience we're having right now. And the simile of the salt crystal goes something like this. So you take a big lump of salt and you put it in a glass of water. Can you drink that water? That water becomes so salty, it can't possibly quench our thirst. But if you put that same lump of salt in a big lake, say a big Himalayan lake, and you allow it to dissolve, you can still drink that water. That, wa that salt is hardly discernible at all, right? Why is that? Because the lake is large. And in the same way, if our minds are large and expansive through the practice of loving kindness or compassion or anapanasati, right? We get into this state called mahagata, the chitta goes to greatness. It becomes the mahagata chitta then even if something difficult happens in our lives, you know, somebody shouts at us or um, maybe we go to work and, you know, we have a lot to do, somehow it doesn't feel like a big problem because it's meeting a mind that's very expansive, yeah? If we have a mind of loving kindness, we notice that we regard our whole lives in a different way. Maybe we wake up and we feel, you know, irritated, we haven't slept well, and we start to look at the past and think, oh, everything went wrong, you know, my life's been a complete disaster <laughs> because we're in a bad mood. The mind is small and contracted, right? So one more thing happens, one little lump of salt comes into our day and, oh, that's the end of it, we just break down. But if the mind has loving kindness, then we perceive our past and our future in a really positive way. We remember all the beautiful things that have happened to us, all the friends that we've forgotten to contact for so long, you know, and even our future starts to look bright because the mind is big, the mind is soft, it's wide. So these are ways of looking that start to undermine the hindrances further. And of course, we can learn to practice in daily life also by guarding our senses, you know, noticing how we're using the sense of sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. You know, are we indulging? Are we regarding, say, food or, I don't know, some good examples? Let's say praise in a wholesome way, you know. Is it leading to us feeling encouraged and inspired? Or is it actually leading to the ego getting a little bit, you know, enhanced? So we start to notice the way we're using our senses, how we're responding to the things in the world, and see that we regard things in a way that leads to wholesome states. So we're almost at nine o'clock and I haven't got through this sequence, but just to go in to good conduct in brief, I would really like to encourage everybody to deepen their practice of sila, not only by regarding sila as restraint, but also in its active form because good conduct can also be positively regarded. You know, we restrain from lying, but can we learn to use our speech in a way that encourages others, that uplifts others? Can we use our speech in a way that brings together those who are divided? 
that inspires and gladdens people? Can we give a little bit more praise and appreciation and gratitude to those people we live with every day? You know, so our speech isn't only about restraining from unwholesome speech, but it's actually using speech in a way that's really beneficial, that goes to the heart, that brings a lot of harmony and happiness to this world. Right? And similarly, you know, with not killing, I'm sure most of us don't actively or intentionally kill living beings unless maybe we're really scared by some kind of creepy crawly. But even beyond there, you know, we actually start to think about how we can protect and nourish and nurture life. So it's more than just abstaining from killing. We're thinking about how we can help others have the conditions in their life that lead to them thriving, you know, that are really for their well-being. And we take, you know, care to protect even the smallest little insects. I've seen people here going around with the brooms and very carefully sweeping the little millipedes into those little uh, sweepy things. What do you call that broom thing? A what is? Dustpan. A dustpan with a stick. <laughs> Hopefully you're putting them back in the bush somewhere that they can, you know, get some food and shelter. But we start to actually regard life as something very precious. Yeah. Instead of stealing, taking what's not given, we start to actually undermine that idea of covetousness, thinking that somebody's got something we need, right? And instead we become generous. We actually give to others who maybe have less than we do. It doesn't necessarily mean giving financially. We can give of our time. We can give a kind ear. We can lend an ear to somebody who needs to talk, who needs to cry, right? We can give our whole lives to the Dhamma. There are so many different ways we can give. What are the other precepts? So sexual misconduct, instead of being somebody who is not reliable or trustworthy in our relationships with others, we become somebody that others can trust, that they can feel safe with. If someone makes a commitment to us, we know that they mean it. And we make a commitment to them as well. Yeah, that doesn't mean that there'll always be harmony, but at least we can reveal our faults. We can reveal our mistakes and ask for forgiveness when it's necessary to do so. Yeah. And what's the last one? Not taking intoxicants or drugs that cloud the mind. So this is for the sake of clarity of mind. Again, you know, it's very hard to establish the kind of mindfulness that sees clearly. So we want to have every possible opportunity to do that. We don't want to give ourselves even more obstacles to overcome. And instead of taking things that cloud the mind, we actually practice things like mindfulness and kindness and increase the brightness in our mind. Yeah? So again, we're being careful about the ways that we use our minds and noticing when these good qualities are present and rejoicing in that. You know, the Buddha said that if we do have good conduct, if we can reflect on our day, forget about the faults, there's always going to be some mistake. Just reflect on the beautiful things that you've done, the times that you smiled or said a kind word to another person or restrained yourself in a way that was beneficial for you or another. Reflect on it and bring it up. You know, bring up that happiness. The Buddha called it blameless bliss. And really allow it to gladden the mind. He said that one that, you know, has beautiful speech, beautiful conduct, can train in wholesome states day and night, happily, with confidence that this is the path. And from that good conduct, as we were saying, it's natural for the establishments of mindfulness to be developed. It becomes really easy because you've weakened the hindrances. And not only that, you've started to get a lot of wholesome joy. This is where we start to turn away from the joy of the senses, which is not really very joyful at all. It's more agitating and exciting, sometimes quite intense, but not very sustaining or, or nurturing. You know, it doesn't really have that quality of peace. So here we're starting to turn towards the happiness that's coming from within from our practice of good conduct, of sense restraint, of learning to regard the world in wise and beautiful, kind, compassionate ways. Yeah? And then associating with those good people. 
This is so important for everybody here. It's only by associating with good people, and that can include reading the suttas, that we deepen our understanding of the Dhamma and deepen our faith, deepen our confidence in this practice. So this is how we reverse the whole cycle from delusion to rebirth <laughs> and in the opposite direction by undermining the hindrances and developing and cultivating these beautiful ways of practice in our everyday life. So the hour has gone. Unbelievable. And I only touched on each factor. I hope that that wasn't too much. I hope that there was something in there that was helpful for you. And I want to just finish by saying, keep on putting drops of water in those jars, you know. And in this sutta, the simile is like the rain. It says that when associating with good persons, when that becomes full, it fills up hearing the good Dhamma. Hearing the good Dhamma becoming full fills up confidence or faith. This becoming full fills up wise attention, which becoming full fills up mindfulness and clear comprehension. This becoming full fills up guarding the senses. Guarding the senses, becoming full, fills up the three kinds of good conduct. The three kinds of conduct becoming full fill up the four establishments, oh sorry, fill up the seven factors of enlightenment. Or no, the four establishments of mindfulness first. Okay, so the three kinds of good conduct becoming full fill up the four focuses of mindfulness, which becoming full fill up the seven factors of enlightenment. The seven factors of enlightenment becoming full fill up true knowledge and liberation. It's just like when it's raining and the rain pours down in thick droplets on a mountain top. The water flows down along the slope and fills the clefts, the gullies, and the creeks. These becoming full fill up the pools. These becoming full fill up the lakes. These becoming full fill up the streams, they fill up the rivers, and they fill up the great ocean. In just the same way, associating with right people, good people, wise beings who've experienced the Dhamma, Becoming full, eventually, this will lead to true knowledge and liberation. That means the end of suffering, the highest happiness of Nibbana. So our job is just to keep that water coming. Whether you think it's small droplets or big droplets, the momentum increases over time. So I would like to end the Dhamma talk here and give you the chance to take a little break before we do some meta meditation. So. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, that was a practice. Now we do the real one. I know it's your last day, but you've got to put everything you've got into this and really get that joy going. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> well done, everybody. All right. So take a 10 minute break yeah. and we'll come, come back, back and we will do some loving 15? kindness meditation. 15 yeah. minutes? No, 10 minutes. So come back minutes, at 9 yeah. 15. Yeah. Now it's 9 05 or 9 04. Okay.